It's game day for Carolina basketball, and I've got to imagine the Charleston Cougars are in for a rude awakening as the Tar Heels take out some game one frustrations. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Friday, November 11th, 2022. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making our show your first listen or your first watch every single day. Please don't forget that we're free and available anywhere you get podcasts, so you can subscribe right now to make sure you don't miss a second of your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Underdog. Sign up on underdogfantasy.com with promo code locked on and get your first deposit doubled up to $100. So here's what we're going to do today. I want to get you ready for this game tonight against College of Charleston. Talk about what uh, you're going to see from the Cougars. Talk about what I'm expecting to see from the Tar Heels, especially coming out of what we saw in game one. And then I want to finish by getting you up to speed on the Carolina women's basketball team kicking off their season. So as for Charleston, it is the Tar Heels second straight Colonial Athletic Association opponent to start this season. UNCW, who Carolina played in their season opener, was picked fifth in the preseason conference poll and Charleston was picked just above them one spot higher. And so, you know, you kind of expect a similar talent level from this mid-major program under the direction of Pat Kelsey, who is in his second season now in Charleston. Speaking of which, you might recall these two teams actually met last year in game three of the season, Um, and that game was actually at Charleston, so a true road game for the Tar Heels. That was a bit of a struggle in that one for Carolina. They ultimately won 94-83, so they won by 11 points, but they trailed at halftime by six, 42-36, and trailed in the first half by as many as 11 points. So uh, a close one there. And as I alluded to in the opening, given the rough game one, rough game one, the less than desirable game one, let's put it that way. And the, uh, the way the, the game went against Charleston last year, I'm looking for Carolina to come out all guns blazing in this one and just absolutely put a hurting on the Cougars. Um, also Charleston did beat North Carolina back in the 2009 10 season that year, right after the national championship team, when you lose Tyler Hansborough and Wayne Ellington and Ty Loss and Danny Green, that whole crew um, was gone. So um, as for Charleston, they are 187th at Kempom right now. They started the season 195th, so they've moved up and they did so courtesy of winning their first game against Charles. Uh, they are Charleston against Chattanooga, excuse me, um, to start the season 85 78 on Monday night. And as we look at this team, man, they've got a guy coming back that is the player you need to know for Charleston as you see them take the court tonight. His name's Ryan Smith. He is a sophomore 6'2 guard from down under. He's an Aussie. You love to see it. He was voted second team preseason CAA and uh, had a great game last year against North Carolina as a freshman. I believe had 19 points in that one to lead the Cougars. He's the leading returning scorer. He was second on the team for Charleston last year at 12.1 points per game. And so you're looking to see what he does in this one. Well, against Chattanooga uh, in their first game, Smith poured in 24 points, led all scores made five threes. And so um, this guy is ready to pull the trigger at any moment and should do so tonight. We expect to see that. As for Charleston's starting lineup, at least in that first game, um, they went with what is a small lineup. And let me just give you the sizes. Smith is 6'2". Uh, another guard, Larson, 6'1", 6'4", 6'5". And then they do have a, a bigger forward in the middle in Mr. Lampton at 6'11". But um, if Charleston decides to go with that starting lineup again, there's going to be a little bit of a height discrepancy. That is Pete Nance at nearly a legit seven feet tall guarding a 6'5", dude. 
right? So I think we will probably see uh, some some different rotation pieces, uh, maybe even in the starting five, although it would be pretty comical if we saw that again. As for Charleston's first game, they had a balanced minutes approach. Nine different players played at least 15 minutes and no one more than 28. And so and we'll look to see that depth on display from Coach Kelsey and his team. So that's a little bit of a primer, but I want to give you um, like five things to expect from Charleston and a little bit of how Carolina will respond to that. Number one, expect a blistering pace. Last season, Charleston was second in all of Division I, 360-some teams, uh, all of Division I college basketball in adjusted tempo per Ken Palm's stats. And so these guys are getting out and going. And remember, last year was the first year of figuring that out under Coach Kelsey. And so you expect it to be an even higher level of it this season. So expect a blistering pace. Number two, expect a ton of threes. Let me give you a good example. I, I talked earlier in the week about how North Carolina only attempted 10 threes against UNCW in their first game, which were fewer than any game last season. The fewest they had all of last season was 13. So Carolina, 10 attempted threes in the season opener. Charleston's Ryan Smith, who we just talked about, he attempted 10 threes by himself in Charleston's first game. The team attempted 29. And so, yeah, expect a lot of threes from this team. That is a staple of what Coach Pat Kelsey's teams at Winthrop did, which is where he was before Charleston. And so I am expecting to see not only a blistering pace, but Charleston getting out to the three-point line. That's why, you know, a lot of that lineup is smaller and it makes sense to play for round one from them. Um, next for... Um, Charleston is that it is not Ryan Smith who's the main playmaker. That would be Mr. Larson, who we talked about just a second ago as one of the starters. He will be the primary playmaker for this team. One of the issues that Charleston had last year was turnovers, 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 turnovers all over the place. And so Larson transfers in from Wofford, where uh, was a much better playmaker held onto the ball uh, much better. And so we're looking to see that from Charleston. Now, as Fourthly, as offensively minded as Charleston is, they're not going to be such a great defensive unit, particularly the, the starting backcourt, um, which is not a good sign for them against the Tar Heels when you think of that means R.J. Davis and is gone this year. And so I, I know they've brought in other quite a few transfers for Charleston this year, uh, but you still expect to not see as high a level of defense. And so expect a high scoring affair in this one. And then the final thing I want to say uh, that I expect to see is I, I have no inside knowledge about this. This is just me basing what we saw a lot last year that Coach Davis would do and thinking about essentially cutting off the head of the snake. I expect to see Leaky Black come out and guard Ryan Smith. Now, I know he's not the main playmaker, but if if he's the one that is finding space to just pull up and go 10 attempted threes, 24 points, I know there's a height discrepancy. He's only 6'2". Leaky's got a 7'3 wingspan. But here's the thing. It wouldn't be crazy. Do you remember when Carolina played Virginia last year? Coach Davis employed Leaky Black to guard the diminutive Kihei Clark, who is Virginia's lead playmaker. And so I, I see no reason why he wouldn't do that again, because why not employ your best defender against their best score, if it works and if it makes sense to do so, right? If it's a, a 7-2 gangly dude, you might not put Leaky on him, but Leaky should be, I mean, his athleticism and quickness allows him to keep up. I expect to see it. So look for that. Does Leaky Black start out guarding Ryan Smith, and uh, that'll be interesting to watch. And if not, who is on Smith, and how does he do? But again, I'm looking to see Leaky Black take that um, charge as he needs to, maybe even literally take a charge. So the bigger question that we're probably all wondering, though, is how does North Carolina rebound from their less than ideal season opener against UNCW? I've got some ideas about it, but first... This episode is brought to you by Underdog. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to spice up this college football season, and it's super easy to get started and play while you watch your favorite team. In fact, I've created my own account with Underdog, and I'll be taking some overs and unders this weekend. 
but it's all going to be overs because North Carolina is playing Wake Forest. So give me all of Drake May's numbers up. Give me all the receivers numbers over as well. And you can go to underdog and make your own picks just like me. Easy to play and available in over 30 states. You just pick between two to five players across any team. Doesn't have to be the Tar Heels and decide if they'll finish higher or lower than the stat given. It's one of the easiest games to play out there. And you could win cold hard cash in a single game. So sign up with promo code locked on, just one word, and Underdog will literally double your first deposit up to $100. So deposit $100, get $100 free. Go to underdogfantasy.com or find the Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store or Google Play Store. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code locked on, all one word. Get in on the college football pick 'em action today. Okay, so now we're going to move into talking about what I'm expecting to see from the Tar Heels. But as we do so, let me remind you to make your second listen of the day locked on sports today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only locked on can provide. Locked on sports today, available on YouTube and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Okay, so I'm going to give you uh, a, kind of an overall thing and then four very specific things I'm looking for from the Tar Heels. First off, the big overall thing is I'm just chalking up Monday's performance in game one to be in game one, right? Like jitters, nerves, Pete Nance is transferring in, freshmen getting their start, all of those kind of things. The the pressure, the the number one of it all, I know they say that doesn't get to you, but it gets to you, right? As an athlete, we've I've been there. I know those feelings. I mean, I've never been a preseason number one team in the nation, but I have been on high levels athletic teams and know what that feels like. So um, first off, I'm chalking it up to game one, but in the same breath, hear me say this. You do not want to repeat what happened in game one tonight against Charleston. <clears throat> not because of national perception, because who cares about that, right? You just do you and let the pundits, let people like me say what we're going to say, because that's what people pay us to do is to hear us talk about it. But if we've learned anything from last season about Carolina, you just got to do you. You just got to be you and keep on going Screw whatever anybody else has to say, and you be the Tar Heels. So the issue is not national perception. The issue is your own perception of yourself as a team, building your own confidence, knowing that we can be a strong offensive unit again. So here's the thing for me. North Carolina needs to come out out of the gate and make a big first half statement, a signature run. Uh, back to back to back threes or getting out in transition. Remember only four fast break points against UNCW, like off to the races, let RJ get out and go and do things like that. So how do you achieve making that happen? Making Monday a thing of the past and saying, no, 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 no. Here's the 2022, 23 Tar Heels. This is the team we expected to see. Here's how I expect to achieve that. Number one, Better offensive efficiency. I mean, I think that's the no-brainer right out of the gate. And, and two reasons for that. Both because North Carolina, quite frankly, is a better offensive unit than they showed on Monday. They shoot better. They were just two for 10 from three. They shot decently from the field, 45% or so. Um, shot well from the free throw line, right? As you expect them to do, right in line with last year's numbers in that regard. Um but you just expect them to come out and do the things offensively that create a bigger gap than the gap we saw against UNCW. So better offensive efficiency, number one, because they're a better offensive team than they showed. And number two, as I said earlier, Charleston projects to, projects to just not be a very good defensive team this season. And so I know, I know that they are going to score points. Just be ready for that. You're going to see Charleston score points at a high tempo. Um, but there should be turnovers and that could lead to some of these runouts that we're going to look for. That's what happens when they pay play at the pace that they play at. That's a very hard phrase to say when they play at the pace that they play at. Try that. You're going to laugh at yourself. Let me know in the comments how you did with that one. So number one, better offensive efficiency. Number two assists. How does this team share the ball? Remember, I've said this a lot. 
Carolina was at their absolute best last season when they were sharing the ball against Marquette to start the NCAA tournament. I believe it was something like 80% of their baskets they had assists on. Um, same was true in uh, game two against Baylor. High, high assist percentage. And so you remember what happened Monday night against UNC Wilmington? Four assists. Just four assists. Pete Nance led the team with two. <laughs> like that's what happened on Monday night. That was the lowest, lowest single game total for the Tar Heels since 1980. Yeah, count that math. That's four decades plus. And that was a double overtime loss to Texas A&M. How embarrassing is that? Two overtimes and you still only got four assists. Um, but here's the good news at least defensively, Carolina only allowed UNC Wilmington to have three assists themselves in that game. And that was an even longer time span since Carolina has held their opponent to that few assists going back to 1975. So I'm looking to see, I mean, it doesn't have to be some outrageous Kendall Marshall number, but can RJ Davis, can Caleb Love get up to three, four, five assists each? Can we see Leaky be a facilitator? We've talked about uh, what a good facilitator Pete Nance is. Uh, clearly, he led the team on Monday night, albeit, again, just with two assists. But uh, you expect to see that out, of, and that's just the starters. Like I expect to see good assist numbers from Seth Trimble. Um, and so we are going to be looking for that. Got to have better assist numbers. And, and in that same breath is what we talked about with only three assists allowed. Can the defense be as sharp? Can it be better? Because you're going to have to defend the three. What's that going to look like? So um, the ways you accomplish looking better than Monday night, number one, better offensive efficiency. Number two, which includes assists. And number three, a way to be better is to not get out rebounded by a second straight colonial athletic association team. Yeah, because remember, Carolina lost the rebounding battle 37 to 32 on Monday night. Now here's the thing with Charleston. They are typically, at least last year, they were a great offensive rebounding team. So can Armando Baycott, can Leaky Black and Pete Nance keep this team off the glass? We're going to be looking to see, uh, you know, on, on their own side, can Carolina gather the defensive rebound and get going out in transition? You just, you just quite simply can't come out and do what you did on night one. You have to dominate the glass in this game, particularly given the height advantages that we talked about earlier. Now, again, I don't expect to see the same starting lineup from Charleston. I think they'll put some more height into their starting lineup because those guys that started game one didn't project to be the, the five starters for this season. So I, I'm waiting to see on that. But in terms of dominating the glass, it's got to start one place. And you know who I'm going to say. It's Armando Baycott. A lot of the issue on Monday night with him not dominating the glass was foul trouble, quite frankly. He sat out a lot of the second half with those four fouls and came back in at the under four timeout, but still only finished with nine. And so, I mean, still super close to a double-double, but nine is an off night for Armando Baycott, if we're being honest with ourselves, for a guy who averages a double-double. So I need Armando. I need North Carolina needs Armando Baycott to have a massive night rebounding score a lot. Sure. Great. Get a crud ton of rebounds in this game, but it could also be Pete Nance that leads the way rebounding. If he has the height mismatch that he projects to given how Charleston chooses to set up their lineup. Um, and it, it might be that they're just going to say, hey, we've got this small lineup. We're going to give up uh, those rebounds and go. So we're watching to see that. Speaking of Pete Nance, this is the fourth thing I'm watching for, for how Carolina can have a better night is just Pete Nance. Now, hear me not saying that Pete Nance is playing bad. I think Pete Nance had a very solid game Monday night. It's just about kind of what Pat Kilby and I talked about on Wednesday's show, him having a more active role in the offense in terms of shots taken. Uh, no reason he shouldn't, especially in this game, again, with the height advantage, get up to double digits in scoring. But specifically, I just, for his own sake, I want to see him make a couple three-pointers. He shot 45.2% last year on 93 attempts at Northwestern. And so what we've seen so far this preseason, 
um, and in game one, it seems to be an anomaly. I, I know a lot of people made a fuss about um, his shot in the exhibition game versus Johnson C. Smith, where he was one for five. He was 0 for one from three against UNCW. So is one for six in the public things in, in public games so far, the exhibition in game one. But um, everything I've heard out of the secret scrimmage against Rutgers is that he hit multiple threes in that game. And so I, I expect it to be better. But you just want to see it, again, for his sake. Now, keep in mind, Brady Manick also got off to a slow start last season in shooting threes. And again, let Brady be Brady. Let Pete be Pete. I'm going to continue to say that all season long. But just keep in mind, there, there is history and precedent for this transfer coming in who's known as a solid to really strong three-point shooter and not getting off to a great start with it. So... That's Carolina. That's Charleston. Cannot wait for this game tonight. Make sure you tune in. It's on those regional sports networks things. For those of you that have ACC Network Extra, um, you can get the link off of my Twitter feed. You can see it there. I posted it uh, earlier in the week. The women's basketball season is now also underway. They started on Wednesday night. What kind of start did they get off to? Uh I'll tell you about it in just a minute. But first, this episode is brought to you by Simply Safe. Did you know that over the holidays, property crimes like burglaries and package thefts spike all over the country? So that's why our friends at Simply Safe Home Security are offering 50% off their award winning security system so that more families can feel safe and secure and have peace of mind in this upcoming holiday season. Now, here's why I love it I have a smart home where everything's basically controlled by Alexa. And so I love the ability to monitor everything from the security system right from my phone. In an emergency, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, professional monitoring agents used Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify that threats are real so that you can get priority police response. Don't miss your chance to save big on the only security system that I recommend. Get 50% off any new Simply Safe system at simplysafe.com slash locked on college today. This is their biggest discount of the year, so don't wait and don't miss it. Again, it's simplysafe.com slash locked on college because there's no safe like Simply Safe. All right, the women's basketball team, they did not get off to the same start as the men's team. It had an absolute blowout against Jackson State, 91 59. I think we call that a slaughtering, and they looked, frankly, fantastic. Game one uh, objectives. In, in any season is especially I, I should say game one objectives against an inferior. <laughs> why can't I say that word against an inferior opponent? Uh, you want to do three things. You want to win decisively check. You want to not get hurt check. And you want to be able to try stuff, right? Combinations, different lineups, different sets, whatever it may be to see how they work. And when you're playing an inferior an inferior opponent and you get off to the start the Tar Heels did, um, that enables you to do a lot of that, especially in the second half of the game. And so you love to see that for Coach Banghart and her crew. So let me give you my four corners takeaway for this game. Uh, for those of you who are new to the show, anytime we recap a Carolina basketball game, men or women, in a way to honor Coach Dean Smith, we do a four corners takeaway. So Four corners, number one, the Tar Heels had a balanced scoring approach in this game. Four different Tar Heels scored in double digits. Oh, but here's the thing. Not one of those four was named Deja Kelly. If this team is going to score 91 points and Deja Kelly is only going to put up seven of those, uh, watch out. Because the number 12 ranking is too low for Coach Courtney Banghart's team and squad. Kennedy Todd Williams, she Toddy, she leads the team and in, in this night with 20 points plus nine rebounds, just one shy of a double double. You love to see that. The other three in double digits, Alyssa Utsby uh, is right behind her with the double double, 19 points and 10 rebounds, and uh, added five assists to it as well. So you love to see that. Eva Hodgson, who we've had on the show before, so we're always rooting for her, uh, gets her first start as a Tar Heel, by the way. 13 points, six rebounds, five assists. Great stat line there. Paulina Paris in her freshman debut, 13 points, two rebounds, four assists, three steals. 
Stat stuffer, what up, Danny Green? You love to see it. So balanced scoring attack, four Tar Heels in double digits, and none of them is Deja Kelly. Man, chef's kiss to that. Let's see it all season long. Number two, the freshman is ready. And I say fresh man, or I should say fresh woman and not fresh women because there's only one of them and it's Paulina Paris who we just mentioned. Literally, there is one incoming freshman on this team. She's the only one, but has a great collegiate debut, um, as you would hope and expect from a highly highly touted prospect of, of her type. Um, but you just never know until somebody comes in and does it. And boy, did she do it. Again, just as a reminder, 13 points, two rebounds, four assists, three steals. Boy, howdy, you will take that from Paulina Paris coming off the bench. Um, and not, yeah, she came off the bench, but she played the second most minutes on the team with 30 behind only Eva Hodgson's 31. Now, part of that is in a blowout like this, you want to get as many minutes to as many people as you can. Um, some, some, leg management, some game management, rest uh, for some of the starters so th that they're more ready to go when you need it in tighter games. But um, Paulina Paris coming out ready to go. Now, uh, number three of our Four Corners takeaway. This was a conundrum to me. You ready for this one? Carolina shot the ball great. During when the clock was running. <laughs> when the clock was stopped, Less than ideal shooting from the free throw line in this one. Check it out. Carolina on field goal. So that's any shot during the course of action. 57.8%. Anything above 50, you love it. But getting up closer to 60%. 37 to 64 from the field. Choice. 35% uh, from three. Seven of 20. We'll take it. Great. <laughs> but you're ready. From the free throw line, the Tar Heels shot under 50%. 45.5% from the free throw line. What, what, what? I, I don't, I don't know. Literally every player that took, that attempted at least one free throw missed at least one free throw. <laughs> That's just, it's so funny to me because you don't expect it, uh, especially from a team that is such a good shooting team. Now, here's the thing. I think it's completely uh, similar to what we said with the guy stuff. Game one, statistical anomaly. You don't expect to see it in any kind of ongoing way, but it did happen. And so we'll see what happens uh, when Carolina gets back into action. And then the fourth part of our four corners is you love to see the team effort with rebound. And keep in mind, this team is a little bit undersized, at least in terms of the starting unit and what they're rolling out. And so when you have a smaller team, it has to be all hands on deck, right? We're all going to help each other out with rebounding. And that's exactly what happened in this game. Let me give you the numbers on it to back it up. Nine total players played in this game. All five starters had at least three rebounds. <laughs> that's pretty neat itself. Six of the nine had three plus rebounds and eight of the nine had at least two rebounds. And so, man, uh, rebounding by committee. Off to a great start with that. And that's what the Tar Heels are going to need to continue to do. And so Coach, Coach Banghart and the rest of the coaching staff can enforce that and encourage the ladies in how they started off. Now, of course, we got to get to a shady stat of the game. We can't just have our four corners recap. We got to have our shady stat of the game. And it is the second quarter's absolute scoring output. The Tar Heels poured in 31 points in the second quarter of this game. The last time the ladies scored more than that in a quarter, they've matched it more recently, but the last time they scored more in a single quarter was almost two years ago, December 3rd, 2020, 35 points in the third quarter against South Carolina State, whom the Tar Heels actually have on their calendar coming up pretty soon. So be watching out for that. Now, the ladies are back in action uh, tomorrow, Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern versus TCU. So getting right going with a uh, another Power 5 opponent. You love to see that. Uh, best of luck to the ladies as they get back in action. Make sure you check it out or even better yet, go to Carmichael, get that atmosphere up and bumping and be part of all the action. Well, friends, that's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels, but it's not it for this week because after the men's basketball game tonight, I will be with you live on YouTube for a postcast to break down the game and take your questions. So come join us for that. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow me at Isaac Shade. 
Thanks again for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen. For your second listen of the day, go check out Locked on Sports Today podcast. The biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and of course, the take of the day. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and anywhere else you get podcasts. Also, don't forget to check out a new show on Locked on that I'm part of, the Locked On College Basketball. It's our national college basketball show, and I am one of the two co-hosts of that. would love for you to check it out. Don't forget to subscribe, smash the like button, leave some comments on today's episode. Can't wait to see this game tonight and see how the Tar Heels do against Charleston. But as for this morning, this afternoon, whenever you're watching, thanks so much for hanging out with me on a Friday talking about Carolina sports because it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, no, until tonight, post-game, peace.